ऑर्गेनाइजेशन So Twitter hasn't announced whether it will be charging for these other two texts because when it introduced the blue text, uh, especially when the Elon Musk shifted and take over the company, uh, he introduced a eight dollar barrier for having obtaining the blue te text marks, and because of that, a lot of people have started after paying for the services having the blue text marks, and that was a one defense against the uh, verification of the fake account, right? And so a lot of people started replicating a lot of fake accounts, and it ended up pretty bad. So now Twitter is saying that they are going to manually identify or verify the accounts. Then obviously we see that there is a strain there in the Twitter why? Because the human resource he has fired a lot of people from the human resource department, so they are in a pretty much bad shape. But then again, if someone is buying Twitter for forty-four billion dollars, I think he has a plan in place, pretty much. But then again, Twitter was not just in the news for that. Elon Musk has also decided to leak the Twitter files, which he said because the current president Joe Biden, his son had uh, some incriminating evidence regarding his dealing with the Russia, and he said that the Twitter executives were actually covering his tracks, and they were actually colluding with the that then uh, vice president uh, Joe Biden. Uh, but then again, this story didn't find much traction. I don't know the reason why, but then again, it is said about the Elon Musk that he has a rightist leanings, and the Twitter top executives who were actually fired have the leftist leanings. And so, I mean, in the coming days, we are going to see these trends where there's a lot of mud raking on the politicians because elections are around the corner. I really do not like this trend. Why? Because I think you should, uh, I mean, entire uh, campaign out on the election manifesto, not on the mud raking or the character assassination. But I mean, it is said that this is how. um the elections in the united states are and uh, th it's there is no dignity and i mean um that thing so um, we will see we will see how the things will roll on so uh, uh, i mean moving on to our top stories which is about our prime minister shahbaz sharif has said that pakistan needs clean environment friendly and cheap electricity to power its economic growth of course in a tweet the prime minister said The present government is working on a plan to diversify the energy mix that will have a safe a previous uh, foreign exchange and provide relief to the people. He also said the government is particularly focusing on solar and hydropower potential. And we have seen that how Pakistan's leadership has emerged a major focal point um especially on the Sharmul Sheikh COP27 conference because we have seen that Pakistan is most vulnerable to the climate change. um and now moving on to our another top stories which is also about the prime minister shahbaz sharif has said that it is a historic moment that the england's cricket team is in pakistan after 17 years he say cricket plays a vital role in strengthening the ties of the nation addressing the reception in the honor of the england pakistan cricket team's prime minister appreciates british government support to pakistan's cricket he also appreciated the efforts of ramiz racha and lords the generosity of ben stokes and of course the cricket team is nowadays in islamabad and we can literally feel their presence because there's special routes for them from where they are traveling to the stadium and then coming back to that um and i mean we are really glad that the cricket is really taking off in pakistan because i think sports is, this is how sports should be and this is how it is okay so moving on to our third top story which is about the death anniversary of legendary kawal aziz mia which is being observed today to remember his work and strong dedication in the field of signing with the medium of qawali uh, so we are remembering aziz mia qawal and also we have a packet to share the life story of his Holding the Prize of Performance Award to his credit, Aziz Mia Kaval churned out 65 albums during his four-decade-long career. Aziz Mia was born on April 17, 1942, in Delhi, India. He started learning Kavali at the age of 10. 
He did his master's degree in Urdu and Arabic from the University of Punjab. Being one of the most educated artists of his time, Aziz Mia's work was enriched with spiritualism. Aziz, wherever he performed, he was known to be an expert at keeping the audience entertained and everyone appreciated his gawalis. His work was an asset to our country. His claim to fame was when he made history for singing the longest gawali during Super hit Gawalis include Allah hi jane kaun bashar hai, Nabi Nabi, Ya Nabi, Main Sharabi, Teri Surat and Admi hai Benazir. While Aziz Mia's contemporaries remember him for his unique style of singing, Gawali listeners still have his music preserved in their libraries. His passion for the field could be seen from his willingness to perform until he breathed his last in 2000. And certainly we remember Aziz Mia Kawal and I think the digital medium is doing a big services in reviving and keeping intact his memories. So digitalization, which is such an important feature of 21st century, is not just playing out in the field of entertainment, but also in the field of hospitality and other fields. So in order to have a more elaborate discussion about the digital marketing and about the hospitality sector and how it is changing the contours in a very fastly changing world, we are very glad that we have been joined by two wonderful guests. Uh, number one, we have Stephen Nagy. He's a consultant, hospitality management. He's also faculty member at the EHL in Switzerland. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to our show. Good morning. Thank you Good very morning. much. Good to be here. Right. So joining Stephen is Tehreem Zulfikar, who happens to be an HR professional at Serena Hotels. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and thank you so much for coming to our show. Thank you so much. Wonderful. So kick starting our conversation, Stephen, I would like to ask you, so we have seen that the customer review is one of the thing um, that the hospitality segment or, or in general businesses are very particular about catering to them and making sure that they are satisfied with that. But sometimes it happens is that they are not satisfied because obviously to err is a man, right? So how do we make sure that we keep our base intact and customers satisfied? Well, it, it has a lot to do fundamentally with the overall culture of an organization. And I think it, it starts with our, with our team, with our staff, with our colleagues. If, if we look well of our, with our staff and, and we take care of them, we nurture them, we, 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 we are here for them, they take pride in what they do, they provide good service. And with good service, hopefully our customers are satisfied. And, and in particular today with digital the digital presence uh, that is here all the time. People are very quick to pick up their phone, uh, make a comment, uh, drop remarks, uh, you know, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever it might be, uh, be real. Right. Uh, but it's the reality of life. And I think the hospitality industry has to live with it. Right. But um, yeah. So yes, thank you. Moving on to Tehreem, we have seen that, uh, and COVID has taught us this, that the creation of the food and the delivery has morphed according to the changing times. What are some of the latest trends in the hospitality segment? Uh, I think after the COVID, if you see people have moved to the work from home uh, true, true. thing. So right. they are working with staycation, they are having a true. work from home thing. So they prefer going to the hotel. They are doing their work with the laptop and enjoying the ambience as well. Mm -hmm. Right. So Stephen, coming back to you, we've seen that smartphone, uh, because everyone has smartphone nowadays, and it is the best medium to tell the about their own story, so it's a good for the storytelling. And we've seen that uh, it's uh, connected with the three Cs, especially about the customer base, with the content, uh, and contacts actually, and also with the, the services that you're providing. So in a very frictionless environment of the smartphone, how do you think Serena is evolving its strategy when it comes to the storytelling and the marketing, merging it with the marketing? Well, I think Serena Hotels and Resorts is a very dynamic company and I think that they've been very proactive mm -hmm. in, in, driving, uh, uh, in driving their social, their, their presence on digital media mm -hmm. throughout. Um, and I think it's, it's, a, it, it's, a very, it's a very tedious process. It's a never-ending process. 
and uh, because one is there 24-7. Um, and indeed, I think hotels also need to understand that they are a stage. They're a stage mm. for not only the guests, but also for the employees. A lot of employees nowadays like to take pictures, share pictures, and these pictures are being published. So um, at the end of the day, we need to prepare the stage. We need to host that stage. And right. I think by that we have a, a, a good presence and I think we drive yeah. the brand True. Uh, to the public. True. True. So Tehreen, we have seen, I think this is a pertinent topic because you and I both share the same gender and we have seen that the corporate industry in itself is a very gendered industry. There's a glass ceiling. Women cannot rise above a particular point uh, because the, that's a very patriarchal setup. So you are doing in a Serena and you've been in the HR for the four years, I believe, yeah. right? How do you see your gender roles playing out in the corporate environment of the Serena? Well, uh, Hajra, if we talk about gender equality, Serena itself is, uh, you know, we are working on fostering the gender equality. We, uh, if I talk about MTO's program, we right. recently had an uh, MTO program and we collaborated with NAST with it, about it. And we, we took few females from there and we trained them and now they are being hired with us and they're working with us. So particularly for the front of the house or for the back of the house, not only the management positions and the non-management positions, we have a lot of females working with us. And they're very confident because we are giving them a right environment, mm -hmm. a safe mm -hmm. environment. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they're having a daycare here. They do not have to worry right. about their children there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, they're, they're very much comfortable working here. Wonderful. Yeah. So I think after the Me Too, the conversations regarding the gender roles have spiked a lot. And I think organizations are doing a lot to cater to that. Um, coming back to you, Stephen, and about the vocational training programs. And in Pakistan, we do not see a very robust framework here about the vocational trainings because the trend is that people really are going into the universities and universities are churning so many thousands of bachelor's, master's mm -hmm. degrees mm -hmm. and PhD degrees without actually catering that actually do, you, do they need that or do they need the skills or the talents? But I do believe that you have expertise in the vocational training program at the Serena. Why don't you enlighten us about it? Absolutely. And I, I think, again, uh, Serena Hotels and Resorts is, is, a, is an excellent example in that respect. I think you've been nurturing a vocational training for the longest time. Yes. And uh, um, uh, Switzerland is very fortunate. We have a, uh, an education program where a vast majority of our young people, they go through apprenticeship programs, mm -hmm. be it as a cook, be it as a carpenter, be it as a, as, a, as a car mechanic, whatever it might be. And that is the foundation of our, of our system. And uh, vocational training in hospitality, there's so much to offer. Um, and in fact, when our school started 125 years ago, it was on the need to train, uh, to train staff. Uh, we had a shortage of staff, so we started training cooks and waitresses and receptionists and whatnot. And I think in the same in Pakistan, there's tremendous opportunities to train young people and give them a diploma as a cook in the service side, uh, be it in housekeeping, be it as a receptionist, administration and whatnot. So, and again, uh, Serena Hotels is doing a great job in that respect. Wonderful. So, Tehreen, we have seen that obviously hospitality sector was um, a lot more vulnerable to the COVID and then recently the flood disaster, obviously, because uh, whenever we want to go for the vocationing, we want to have a very nice hotels. And when there is a flood or the climate induced calamities or the vulnerabilities out there, obviously it's going to affect it. So what are the, some of the challenges Serena Hotel is facing and catering to them? Well, if I talk about the challenges, uh, COVID, has not COVID has affected the hospitality industry. True. But uh, we have coped up well, okay. and tourism is back. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, it, if I talk about particularly Islamabad, we have uh, business has not been affected. Mm -hmm. We are back on the track. Right. And if I talk about northern properties, we are still, you know, uh, everything is fine. And we are not being, you know, suffered a lot. Right. And yeah. what are some of the other challenges? I mean, apart from these vulnerabilities. Okay. Oh, if I talk about the challenges overall in yeah. the hospitality yeah, industry, yeah. you yeah. will find lack of skilled manpower because right. again we do not have executive education programs here we right. do not have hospitality degrees or the institutes which are you know uh, being taken care of in pakistan so to improve the manpower here to skill to give them the skills mm. we need the education we need right. that uh, institutes and we are basically improving because of that Bec uh, 
we have collaborated with EHL here right. and to you know improve our talent right. and our associates right. uh, I think education is very important. Wonderful. Yeah. So every hotel tries to give a very experience, memorable experience mm -hmm. to its customers, right? And what Serena has seen that they're very much particularly invested into the, the cultural yeah. moorings of the particular region. So if you go to the Islamabad branch, you will see the particular, I don't know what's the English alternative for that, but you see the jarokas and, and the old windows that are there mm -hmm. inside the Serena and that gives you a very traditional sort Ethnicity, of a touch, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So can you explain about this, this marketing strategy of yours with respect to the cultural moorings, any of you? Well, I, I can maybe I can I can start if mm -hmm. you don't mind. Um, uh, my first impression when I arrived in, in Islamabad a couple of days ago at the Serena Hotel, right. I was absolutely taken aback. Right. I've seen pictures on the internet, but seeing that hotel, the the, the lobby, the, the the beauty of that <coughs> surrounding, and I think then combined with the courtesy of people, I think that makes it absolutely unique. And, and today's travelers, they no longer want to have a cookie cutter experience. People want to have a unique a local experiential experience and I think that's what they're looking yeah, for and I think that's what you provide. Yes, and they basically, you know, uh, people get the sense of ownership. Mm -hmm. They get True. the cultural aspect. When they see the cultural aspect, they, they feel that they are, you know, at the home. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's very true because I do remember when I went to uh, abroad, especially Europe, so I really wanted to have a mesmerizing experience with respect to that uh, indigenous culture, the local culture there. Mm -hmm. Because I think you can find the, the uh, multinational corporations everywhere around the world, and mm -hmm. I mean they're the same all around the world, but experiencing something particularly which is very cultural mm -hmm. is something that is, I mean, very yeah. unique, and it's experience I hold it really dear. Um, so talking about the, um, I mean, faculty and the training and from the EHL you are training, so what are some of the challenges which you have identified, especially from the Western perspective? I think one of the promise that we, we see we see trends changing very fast these true, days. True. And I think uh, in the past, maybe things lasted much longer, where today right. trends might last for six months, one year, two years and whatnot. So organizations need to be very nimble. And therefore, educa uh, uh, executive education is an ongoing process for everybody to be nimble and, and accept the fact that we need to be able to quickly adapt to the new environments. We've seen Corona put everything upside down, True. but we had to move on. We had to get back on our feet and keep going. So, and I think in that respect, edu uh, executive education is, is a very yeah, important right. aspect. Right, right. I mean, you're mostly collaborating with Serena here in Pakistan. Absolutely, and it, it's, a, it's a wonderful collaboration. The, the team is, is, is great, and the people, not only from Serena Hotels, we have also uh, 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 people joining us from hospitals, from uh, various banks. other uh, banks, other corporations in, in, in Pakistan, Islamabad. It's absolutely fantastic, and, and people are so hungry and interested to learn and, and, and further their, their knowledge. And, and what are some of the opportunities that you see here when it comes to the vocational training? Vocational training, I think there is, people of Pakistan are, are, are so friendly and polite and forthcoming. To just to give you a little example, my first experience arriving here, uh, yesterday morning at 4.30 at the airport, I was waiting for my luggage to arrive. I was standing at the belt like everybody else. Right. And here comes my suitcase. And to my left is, is a young Pakistani man. And uh, I, as I picked up my suitcase, he said to me, welcome to Pakistan. And uh, it's, I've been traveling a lot. I've never seen that before. And I thought, that really makes a difference. <laughs> Wonderful. And so, Tahirim, coming back to you, we have seen that um, obviously in a digital world that never sleeps, right? you always active online. And then, you know, you're having a satisfied customers and also you need to satisfy your th the customers and employers. How do you juggle the entire and make sure that your profits are also rising? It's a very tough um, segment or the sector to cater to. So how do you make sure you check the all right tick boxes? Well, uh, again, uh, it's a tough question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. Everyone knows their job right. uh, at our hotel. Right. Everyone knows their job and everyone knows that they have to ensure that our customer is you know, satisfied mm -hmm. and at the end of the day, our employee is also satisfied. Mm -hmm. So if you know, uh, we, we basically work on word of mouth. And right. then if you talk about word of word of mouth, our customer is, you know, saying something on the on the social media platform. True. 
and I think that has a more long-term impact mm -hmm. rather than having a 30 seconds ad and you know telling people mm -hmm. about us instead of you know I think that's better if we tell about the story right. and the experience of our guest at the hotel right. it has a long-term impact uh, that rather than you know sharing the 30 second ad and telling people about true, ourselves true. Yeah. And which is mostly boring because yeah. we just try to you know skip it away. True. So yeah. you want to add something about that? No, no. I, I think you're you're absolutely right. And right. I think now that there's you know apps like Be Real. Right. Mm. Uh, I think I mean we we learn from our children. We we have children, and being real is we we as adults we think that this is somewhat strange. But right. th this is today's reality. Again, this morning I was having breakfast. You see people walking around their mobile phones, going around the mm -hmm. breakfast right. buffet yeah. and telling their friends back home how beautiful yeah. it is. So, right. so I think it is, uh, as you said, uh, spending it? money on, on the commercial is one thing, but uh, uh, let people be our ambassadors and our, our, yeah, our judges. Mm. True, true. Uh, okay, so moving on to the digital hospitality, right, or the digital marketing aspect of the hospitality, and we've seen how much vital it is uh, in order to cater to your businesses, especially in the 21st century. So what are some of the latest trends that you have noticed in the digital hospitality? I, I think at the end of the day, it has a lot to do with our, our constant presence on, 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 on social media. Social right. media is the most important uh, a platform and driver for, for, for us being present. Uh, you know, print media is pretty much a thing of the past. Um, now we must engage all the time and whether it is not only with our customers but also we need to engage with our employees. True. Um, I don't know how far we are here but in other parts of the world employees in fact play a vital role to convey a message back because uh, Gen Z who is, who is the most important customer we have in time to come, they know nothing else but social media or no. no uh, in terms of communication, so it is particularly important, and we need to factor that in and include that in our in our planning. Right. So, Tehreem, we have seen that uh, I think hospitality tech sector is a well-established platform and industry in the Western world, but in Pakistan, it is now taking off, and I think there is a lot of scope when it comes to the hospitality sector. How can we improve that and make sure that it is on the track and, and keeps going on? Hadra, I think um, uh, hospitality industry, I believe it's, it's all about human behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, it comes from within right. and then you basically polish your skills. Right. And to polish your skills, you need education again. Mm -hmm. We need to have right platform and right facility to be provided to the associates and the pra pra uh, practitioners themselves so that you know they can flourish and they can nourish the associates working under them. Right, yeah. right. Stephen, we have seen that hospitality sector or the industry has spawned a lot of jobs and they've hired people from not just their own industry but from the other industries as well. So for example, for the digital marketing team, you need to hire uh, the, the tech people or the digital experts or the people from the advertising background and similarly uh, and other segments from the hospitality sector. So with, with such sort of you know job creation that it spurs, how do you see the future of hospitality segment? I mean, what are the, some of the trends that you see are getting redundant and we need to work on, especially in the context of Pakistan? Mm. I, I think the typical hotel I is a probably a thing of the past. I think hotels uh, evolved to, to a, a, different, a different level these days. Uh, we talk in the past, we had hotels, we had the rooms, we had food and beverage, we had a we had a spa and then we had these facilities. Right. Nowadays, hotels are, uh, for instance, the lobby and, and the lounge is, 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 um, is a combined venue. We see co-working spaces in hotels. Mm. We see retail coming into hotels more and more. True, so, yeah. so we see hybrid uh, uh, structures in hotels where we go to a hotel to have a good time, to meet True. friends, to conduct business to celebrate to to enjoy ourselves right. and I think more and more the hotel becomes becomes also part of the local surrounding right. the neighborhood True. Uh, and I think this is how hotels uh, are going to evolve in that direction that's very true Tahim coming to you we have seen that I mean the hospitality segment has 
uh, breed is, is a breeding ground sort of for the local empowerment also right uh, so if you go to the mountainous areas especially in Gilgit Baltistan or Kashmir side you've seen that there are a lot of local dhabas who have come up and the local people are actually the guides there you know who can tell you a lot of indigenous uh, information or wisdom about that particular area right but obviously they are not that much trained uh, when it comes to catering to the uh, tourists out there so I do believe that Serena is doing something in this regard. Would you yes. like here to elaborate? Um, I think when we are in the community, it, it's, it's, it's give and take. It works right. both ways. If we are, you know, in the community, we have to serve them as well. So when, if, if we talk about uh, northern areas, we right. have, uh, we are doing our CSR there. Right. We have females there. We, we have a particular area designated to them. They are you know, ha weaving uh, the clothes and then, you know, they are working on honey there. We have uh, a lot of things in which we basically, imp we, are pr we are trying our best to empower females there and the local community as well so that, you know, they can um, run their homes and basically uh, empower the local in skills. indigenous community. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you so much, Aim, for coming so much. out to our show and enlightening us about the digital marketing, about the broader contents and the contours of the hospitality segment and obviously it has a lot of scope in Pakistan because people are vying to go out to explore something new. So we're going on a short break, don't go anywhere. Welcome back and uh, thank you so much for staying tuned to the PTV world. Okay, so uh, my dear viewers, we know that it's a uh, winter season and winter season is famous for the dryness and for a lot of viral season influenza apart from the uh, peanuts and a lot of dry foods. Um, I do think that uh, nowadays because there is no rain, there is a lot of dryness, especially in Islamabad. So a lot of kids are getting affected by these viral influenza season. And we've also seen in the recent years that the trend is changing especially when it comes to the viral seasons or the um, in influenza because it is mutating and something is wrong is going on. So in order to have a more elaborate discussion, or especially when it comes to the children because they're one of the vulnerable uh, population out there who do get this influenza from the schools or from the other close spaces and then they transmit it to their homes and, and all the people who are in contact with them. So we need to have a discussion, especially regarding how to protect our kids and how to protect uh, ourselves from these viral infection season, right? Um, so I'm very glad that we have been joined by Dr. Shazia Batul Nakvi. She happens to be consultant pediatrician at the Maruk International Hospital. Assalamu alaikum and thank you so much, Dr. Saiba, for coming to our show. Wa alaikum assalam. Welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. So, Dr. Saiba, we have seen um, we're going to talk about the seasonal viral infections, right? So, uh, tell us about them. What are exactly, how do you define them? How do we categorize them? Is it something very serious and about the intensity? Uh, so, please go ahead. So, uh, viral infections are rampant in winter. You know, the, the, uh, the common cold and these things are, uh, th uh, these infections start in the winter months. Maybe because uh, one thing is that the viruses uh, survive more in the cold weather. Right. And also people get together indoors and their uh, the transmission rate is higher. Right. So uh, the common cold, which is um, a mild illness, usually we may have a little low grade fever, otherwise runny nose and mm -hmm. eyes and mm -hmm. congestion and mm -hmm. these things. Uh, it lasts for a week or so. It can right. take some time. Right. And what mm. about uh, the protection against it? Because um, I don't know, you need to correct me if I'm wrong, but I've heard that uh, it takes a time to, I mean, uh, dissipate, right? 
So even though if you ha are having the medicines, uh, they're not going to be particularly helpful, especially on the flu, because uh, the flu takes its time. So what's yeah. your the medical opinion about it? Yes, so you're ex uh, right, exactly. Viruses, do, there's not, not a lot like in bacterial illnesses, you have antibiotics, you take it, and the next day you g improve and get better. Right. So viruses take the time. Right. And uh, just need hydration and rest and... Uh, uh, it might take some decongestants. Right. And but viral virus il, uh, viral illnesses can get uh, bad also. Like the upper respiratory infections right. uh, are just like common cold. But little children, especially infants, can get lower respiratory infections with bronchiolitis, and uh, that's another virus, a respiratory syncytial right. virus. Right. So there are different viruses which can cause uh, different illnesses, and right. they can get uh, quite sick too. Right. So in little children, you should see if they are getting tachypneic or their respiratory rate is increasing or they're having recessions in the chest right. or if they get blue. So that is uh, an, a reason for concern. R and uh, that should be taken as warning signs by parents and they should come to a doctor immediately. Right. And uh, talking, having this conversation regarding the antibiotics because um, a lot of uh, conversation regarding around that, that how um, people are getting very resistant to the antibiotics because the more you consume, the more the sort of immunity is built ag against it and virus mutates accordingly. Uh, so what is your opinion regard regarding having antibiotics at every, I mean, I mean s sort of uh, very trivial sort of a virus or seasonal um, infection. So what is your opinion regarding that? So the, uh, this is a misconception that for every infection you just take antibiotics. So viral right. illnesses like uh, the common flu or right. uh, uh, even bronchiolitis and um, um, influenza, antibiotics do not work. It's no use. Right. So uh, yes, of course, if there's a streptococcal sore throat, which right. is uh, causes high, may cause high fever, sore uh, pain in the throat and difficulty swallowing, but well, clinical signs. Right. In that, uh, an ant antibiotic would be effective and that right. should be taken. Right. Uh, so, uh, the antibiotics should not be used um, just as a routine for every illness. Right. So, uh, talking about the influenza, uh, just elaborate us about the importance of vaccinating your kids against the influenza. How important is it and what is exactly the, the age in which you need to vaccinate your children against this influenza? Okay. So uh, fl the flu vaccine, which is right. generally say the flu vaccine, which okay. can be given annually, once a year. Right. And <coughs> from one year onwards, children can have the vaccine. Right. So that is a preventive measure and uh, it, decrease, it significantly decreases the amount of um, uh, uh, flu attacks a child has. Right. And uh, so other vaccines like COVID vaccine also, you know, that uh, that has been, that should be taken. Right. And the uh, basic general measures of hand washing and sanitizing, right. and uh, that is very important. Right. Yes. And there, Dr. Saib, are some concerns regarding the vaccinating children who are immunocompromised, right? Because it is said that the immunity is not effective against it. How do you recommend, I mean, the parents of those kids uh, of getting the vaccinated their children against the influenza or, or such kind of diseases for that matter? Um, yes, viral, uh, you can see if the child is immunocompromised or is on steroids, then they should be careful right. about vaccinations and they should go to the doctor right. and as the doctor advises. Okay. Right, right. And what are some of the risk factors that make it, uh, that make children very vulnerable to the seasonal infections? Because Dr. Saiba, we've seen that especially when the small children, they're very reluctant to wear the socks or the um, sweaters or, or any other mm -hmm. warm coverings out there. Uh, and it's a very tough job, especially for the mothers to make sure that they are not running their feet around. So what are some of the protection measures and the risk factors, especially in the protection measures that we need to take in order to protect our children? Yes, definitely keep your children warm and uh, they should be protected. And it's a responsibility of the parents to keep them pr uh, children protected. And uh, other than that, um, the risk factors. The risk factors for getting infections. Yes, other than that, there should not, not be smoking inside the house. Okay. And uh, elders who have an infection, they should not expose children to that. Should right. be careful with uh, handling children. If you are ill yourself, then you should separate yourself. Right. And uh, avoid transmission. Right. 
uh, I mean, I know you are a doctor and obviously whenever uh, a sick child comes in, you will go for the screening tests and whatnot. But are there any home remedies that we can imply to make sure that our children are protected against these seasonal viral infections? So, uh, other than the routine vaccinations, what and are the, the good and foods that you yes, need to have? You need to have healthy food. Children should not have junk food, like uh, you know, now fast foods are the True. trend, and True. having a lot of your know, chips, lawn teas, and True. Pepsis, and all the junk you, you know you can buy. Right. So avoid that, and children should have healthy food, right. and supplement with vitamin D and uh, calcium and other B complex vitamins and as needed, Chil because you know our population is so deficient. In um, these micronutrients as well. Okay, so uh, um, uh, Dr. Shazi, we have seen that there are a lot of multivitamins, um, uh, especially when the adults taking because whenever there is a deficiency in the body. Uh, do you recommend the same for the kids out there, especially in this winter season? Well, if the diet is healthy and balanced, you don't need to. If you, the children are taking fresh, fresh fruits, vegetables, getting enough sunlight. Mm. So you don't need to supplement, but uh, if your uh, diet is not that good and uh, as we that we have plenty of sunlight, but 80% of our children are vitamin D deficient. They're not playing in the sunlight and you know, all, um, screen time has increased. And True. So all these things are um, causing um, imbalance in the, in the um, diet and in the lifestyle. Right. Th these modifications need, th that's a big topic, you know, di lifestyle modifications and all that. So c can you elaborate on those uh, lifestyle modifications? Well, screen, uh, one thing is very important that please try to reduce the screen time. Right. Children should not have screen time during the weekdays. On the weekend, you can allow some uh, screen time. Right. And according to age, we have different um, limits for screen time. Right. S and for example? Like for uh, school, uh, school going children, yeah, um, mm, uh, well primary school children, it right. should uh, can be up to half an hour to an hour a day maximum. Okay, okay. okay. that it a should day. not exceed that. Yeah. yeah, in the weekdays and in right. the weekends it can be two to three hours for recreation. Right. Uh, but uh, it, sh it should make it less than that. Okay. So, so I think it's uh, especially in a very digitalized world when the adults are so much glued to the screens, it's very difficult to make your children understand that you need to be, yeah. uh, you need not to have that much exposure with the screen because obviously they do what they imitate their yeah, parents, right? The example, their society yes. and it's very difficult to keep them away from that. Uh, and because of that, I don't know if th there's a medical research to back that up, but I s do see that a lot of kids are facing a lot of problems. For example, um, I think the visual impairments and, and, and other uh, neuro uh, diverse diseases or, or the conditions, whatever do you call them. Um, and especially there was this uh, article that I was reading regarding the cocoa melon that how it is triggering a lot of disorders within the kids who are so much glued to the screens. Uh, but then again, moving on to the children, uh, Dr. Saiba, we have seen in, in my research yielded this fact and you are going to elaborate that. The children who, are, uh, who have multiple comorbidities, um, they're more vulnerable and, and they need to be exposed towards the vaccines. So what's the medical opinion regarding that? Yes, children who are allergic, like children who have allergic rhinitis or reactive airway disease, mm -hmm. they, they should be vaccinated. They should get the annual influenza vaccine. Mm -hmm. It's uh, more important to get them vaccinated and uh, protective measures for them are more important. Right. So, and, and we've seen that the mumps is really viral nowadays, right? Um, so, how can we protect ourselves against it? So it is a viral illness ma like measles, mumps, and uh, these are viral illnesses. And we have the vaccine, you know, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, mm -hmm. which is given at uh, 15 months, and then a booster is again given at four to five years. Mm -hmm. So the vaccinations are again, the, you know, the primary series and the boosters and the, all the recommended vaccines. They are important for protecting, giving, immu giving the active immunity to the child. Right. So you should have the vaccinations and otherwise, you the ag again, the simple measures of hand washing and mm -hmm. uh, cleanliness and these things. And, and this is also our, in mm. our religion, right? It yes, is said that the cleanliness right. is yes. your half faith, right? So Dr. Saiba, you are a pediatrician and obviously a lot of people must walk into your uh, hospital or, or the, the room and they're talking about a lot of different um, diseases which their kids are suffering from. 
what are some of the very common disease that uh, and a trend that you can identify through your patients and how can we remedy that? So in, in the winter months, again, the upper respiratory tract infections and the lower respiratory and the gastrointestinal infections as well. Right. Uh, they which are mostly viral, but we have bacterial infections still going on, like enteric is mm. even going on now right. uh, in the winter months even. And the uh, children can get pretty sick. So try to avoid outside food, junk food, marketplace food, right. and have good uh, ho a balanced diet at home home cooked food, I would advise that. Right, and it's very <laughs> difficult to protect your children nowadays because I mean they're exposed to so much uh, content out there and especially with the canteens. And I do remember when we were growing up, our yeah. mother was particularly strict about not having junk food from uh, outside. And if we could, I mean, uh, secretly smuggle in into our houses that would, and if she discovers that, that we are eating that, that would be a different story altogether. But I think nowadays there's so much consumerist trend um, that kids are having the junk food and, and I, I don't think so. There's um, a very strict um, clampdown in our houses to, to protect our kids about that. But then again, it brings us to the importance of having a healthier lifestyle, a healthier diet, um, because all of these diseases stems because there's something wrong with our lifestyle. And we need to, I mean, remedy that trend. Uh, Dr. Saiba, thank you so much for coming to yes, our show definitely. and for enlightening us about the, these viral issues, seasonal viral diseases. And we've seen that a lot of kids now are actually getting that. And, and especially they are more vulnerable in a closed environment. But that is the perfect breeding ground. Uh, breeding ground. And the kids get them and then they go back home. And they also, the people who are coming in contact with those, those kids are also actually vulnerable with that. And I think simple protection measures like washing your hands and cleanliness can protect you against these viral diseases. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Saiba, for coming Welcome. to our show. Mm -hmm. And this brings us to the end of our segment, and we are wrapping it now. Uh, so until next time, it's a good bye.